welcome back to What A Barb, a pollen podcast. I'm Oz and this week I'm joined again by Lecky Beans and Veg as we continue our pollen rewatch of season one of Bridgerton. This week we'll be breaking down everything Pen and Colin from season one, episode seven, Oceans Apart. But before we get started on the episode, let's go through the breaking crumbs of the week. So Lecky, what have you got for us this week? Hello Barbkin. First we have the crumb that sent everyone clowning this week, the pollen season one and season two compilation posted by Netflix on TikTok. What does it mean? We don't know. Could it be a soft launch for season three promotion? It's possible, but we still don't have an official release date or know if the strikes will impact the timeline of promotion or the release of season three. Regardless, we all sat and fawned over the clips as if we'd never seen them before in our entire (laughs) lives. Thank you Netflix for that or whoever put those clips together you're up there in our hall of fame with a poor person who wrote the netflix portugal to doom post on instagram thank you for your service what (laughs) else have you got for us moving on shondaland released a new feature with bridgerton composer chris bowers called composing the culture in the two-part interview which you can find on shondaland's social media pages chris talked about his journey into composing and the influences behind his work when discussing his work for the bridgerton universe chris said it was awesome and that he was able to play with how emotional and thematic and big music can be adding that music in the show is allowed to be its own character rather than just something in the background and I bet we can all agree that the music in Bridgerton definitely feels like a character in its own right it just brings so much to the series oh we love Chris and we cannot wait to hear what he's got for us in season three yes we'll have more speculation about that in an upcoming episode in more somber news, however, Julia mm-hmm. Quinn has announced that she's taking part in the hashtag Romance for Maui virtual auction, donating a game and tea bundle, as well as a complete autographed special edition of the Bridgerton novels. All funds raised will go directly to supporting the relief efforts in Maui following the devastating fires there. We'll link the auction in our show notes, alongside an article listing different ways you can support those affected by the disaster. Regarding the strike, the WGA had another meeting with the AMPTP on Tuesday. There have not been any announcements about them meeting for further talks and I would definitely take any news about the meeting on Tuesday with that you may have seen online with like a huge grain of salt unless the WGA makes a statement as the AMPTP kind of have a tendency to spin the narrative and release their own version of the proceedings. As always we want to continue to voice our support for the strikers and hope their demands are met in full. On weeks like this where we've received that crumb from Netflix we know that it can be really confusing for fans who want to be a fan of the show while still showing their support. So as far as we are aware any guidelines you may have seen apply to actors and influencers who are part of the union or aspire to be. That's because those union members often perform promotional duties as part of their contract, so they're deliberately withholding that power right now, so to speak, because they are on strike. However, the unions are not calling for a fan boycott at this time. If you're totally confused, we get it, and we'll be linking resources in our show notes and on Instagram about the roles of fans and what we can do in this time. That being said, the best thing that we can do right now is donate, talk about the strike, and to 10 pickets if you're able. We've mentioned before that the Entertainment Community Fund is a great organization that's providing assistance to some of the entertainment workers who are most in need if you would like to donate. The MPTF, which is the Motion Picture and Television Fund, has also sent out an urgent plea for donations this week to help below-the-line crew members affected by the strikes, calling them the forgotten casualties during the strike. So many of those members are at risk of losing their homes, their cars, and their ability to pay utility and medical bills right now. So we will be sharing links to both organizations in our show notes and on Instagram, please consider donating if you are able. Finally, to bring up the mood a bit, I'd like to wish a happy birthday to a certain picture that continues to befuddle pollen fans for my necklace truthers out there. Today, August 17th, (laughs) is the one year anniversary of that photo that Nicola posted behind the scenes with the blacked out necklace. A historic moment. (laughs) Yes. So we eagerly await to see whatever in that necklace is, if anything, in season three. Necklace truth is, we've got you. I know the other two on this podcast aren't on board with us. <laughs> yeah. But if you were out there believing as we do, we're with you 100% of the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that, Lecky. We'll speak to you next week to see how things are going. But until then, should we get back to the episode? Thanks for those crumbs, but now it's time to get started on our rewatch. We had a huge episode last week as we reached the climax of the Colin Marina Pensa plot and Marina's pregnancy was finally revealed in Whistledown, just moments before Colin and Marina were set to elope. Have things finally started to settle down? Are we in for more drama? Only one way to find out? Lady Veg, give us our episode summary. Dearest gentle listeners, following the exposure of Marina's pregnancy in Lady Whistledown, Both the Bridgerton and Featherington households find themselves at the centre of scandal. 
As the distance between Daphne and Simon continues to grow wider, the pair return to London. The ton attends the Queen's luncheon. Eloise continues her hunt for Lady Whistledown and stumbles upon a suspect. Lord Featherington makes Will a tempting offer. Thank you for that, Lady Veg. Beautiful as always. Thanks. Strap yourselves in, everyone, because we're heading straight into scandal. Ooh. Going to start this week over at Cliveden, where things aren't looking too good for our newlywed Duke and Duchess. The tension is interrupted, though, when Rose brings in the latest edition of Lady Whistledown. Daphne reads through it and announces she's got to head back to London as her brother seems to be embroiled in scandal, which is extremely helpful considering she has four brothers and doesn't specify exactly which brother she's talking to. That's true. So in my head, Simon is sat there thinking that Gregory has just wreaking havoc all over the town. <laughs> so as the Bassets head to London, we're jumping back to the world of the town where we see that everyone is reading the latest edition of Whistledown and lapping up every bit of the drama. Lady Whistledown chimes in to let everyone know that Miss Marina Thompson's recent fall from grace continues to echo through every drawing room in town. Days after it was revealed, her engagement to Colin Bridgerton was nothing more than a sham. Poor Colin. He's the talk of the town in the most humiliating way. Lek, how's he doing? So we see him over at the Bridgerton house. Colin Yellow Sheets Bridgerton is crying in bed. For those who haven't spent a significant amount of time zooming in on his face in sad edits, there's actually <laughs> a little tear on the left side of his face right near the corner of his eye. So um, yeah, while we all feel terrible for Colin, this scene is kind of exciting for Apollon fans because it's our first peek into Colin's bedroom and we find out he has yellow bedding, yellow sheets. Yeah, this scene is legend in the Colin... The Pollen world. Uh, the, Wow, yeah. This is this is the stuff we live for. <laughs> I think when everyone realised this, everyone lost their minds. It's just, God bless the set designers for their services to this fandom. And it's the details like this that keep us going and give us faith in the good shit pollen. Do you think he chose them himself? Do you think that Violet chose them for him? Yeah, I feel like men in that time didn't make many decisions of that nature. Yeah, I feel like he probably didn't make many decorating decisions, but just like fate aligned that the yeah. world around him reflects his subconscious. Do you think the universe is really like screaming at him? Yes, like giant <laughs> swans, yellow walls, <laughs> yellow sheets. Exactly, and he didn't strip them off the bed, so. No, he loves them, he loves them. I can't wait for Penn to walk in in the engagement scene and to be like, what the fuck is wrong with you, babe? <laughs> it's gonna be great. And he's not doing great. He looks pretty distressed. This is one of the moments that shows us how good he is at working with small moments like this as an actor. Mm -hmm. Like we can just sort of see even this split second clip of him yeah. sort of tossing and turning in bed is immediately good but yeah he's not doing great but he looks great there's something subtle and I sort of spotted it throughout the episode that as well as him sort of acting it I think there's something to be said about the makeup and what's been done because he's sort of got that sort of glisten and the pink yeah. of his cheeks like he's been crying sort of throughout a lot of the episode and it's true there is a little bit of a shine there the heartbreaking yeah it's just a perfect shot I think and he's not wearing a cravat, so the Free the Net campaigners are absolutely rejoicing. It's not a great moment for him, but we're like, yes. It's great for us. It's just the little turn that he does after yeah. that profile shot is amazing. I think it's very important for us to remember for season three that he is a beautiful crier. <laughs> and I don't like to see him upset, but this is also my favorite, well, one of my favorite shots of the entire show. And like you said, Veg, I really agree. It's just a very short scene. He's literally just staring at the ceiling and then he turns. But it's played so perfectly. It's like that subtlety that you're saying. I think Luke has a really good way of demonstrating Colin's interiority. We know that he has a bit of a tendency to kind of retreat into himself, especially when he's unsure or wounded or he just runs away. And this is a moment where he's really trying to process that pain and embarrassment. Yeah, I think it's a long time before he really re-emerges from this. So a beautiful shot, a beautiful moment. Okay, so he's not doing too well. So let's give him a little bit of space to have a bit of a cry by himself and let's check in on everyone else, see how they're handling the scandal. So there's an awkward moment between the Featheringtons and the Bridgertons as they're leaving their house at the exact same time. No one's doing particularly great, as Lady Whistledown reminds us that A lady's disgrace does not merely tarnish her own name. Like the Towers of the Thames, it also leaves a horrid smear on anyone nearby. Over at the Medice, Elle is venting her frustrations at how the scandals impacted her bestie. And, you know, she says they did nothing wrong, but their reputation is destroyed. Violet reminds her that their own reputation is just as in a perilous position. Everyone's reputation is in tatters. How's Marina doing, Veg? While there is no parasol in the world strong enough to shelter a ruined woman, the fallen Miss Thompson can only hope she shall find a refuge somewhere. 
So yeah, it's not looking good. She has been ruined. She's struggling to find anywhere that will take her in. And from what I can imagine, even a refuge is not going to be a great place for her and her baby. And there we have it. You know, we've got the confirmation that it's worked. Penelope's plan has worked and she's willingly sacrificed her family's reputation and she's left Marina as a fallen woman with nowhere to go. And obviously Penelope knows the consequences of her actions because she's there reporting it as Lady Whistledown. It was a big price to pay and we know that this is the moment that gets Penelope... The most controversial one, for sure. It was not like she did it lightly, like her family could have been ruined. Like it, it turned out sort of okay in the end, but she sort of, as you said, willingly sacrificed her family's reputation yeah. and we can't let that go really. And it's morally grey, I guess, but she, you know, she didn't just do it for fun. Yeah, I think we touched on this in the the last episode, but in the early part of the last episode, she said that she would not uh, bring scandal to her family yeah. I think in a conversation with Marina. And by the end of it, she ends up doing that because she she feels like she needs to but she obviously didn't take the decision lightly and it's a good point where you said veg about it does work out okay in the end for everyone but she didn't know that at the time she knew that she was condemning marina that was the price she chose to pay and in her head it was worth it to save colin and like you say extremely morally gray mm. but that was the decision she made yeah also she's 17 years old just a reminder So back at Bridgerton House, the drawing room has turned into something of a war room with Anthony, Violet and Benedict all gathered around to strategise their way out of this scandal. Colin's there too, kind of set slightly apart from the others and he's still upset as he wants to know why he's not allowed to visit Marina. He says Miss Thompson must be in agonies over these lies, showing that he's still struggling to accept the Whistledown was telling the truth about Marina. He's a broken hearted boy and he d- I don't think he wants to believe the worst. Is, you know, mm-hmm. bless him, this has just really been thrown on him. And Violet kind of looks at him really pityingly and starts to reply a bit. Anthony kind of chimes in because I love Anthony when he's like this. He goes full crisis mode. What's he thinking about it? That the ton devours every bit of Whistledown's on D is the only thing keeping this family from shame. Because of her, no one believes you are the father of Miss Thompson's child. But if you were to go near her, they'll presume you're responsible for her ruin and your sisters will pay the price for your notoriety. Ain't those the facts. <laughs> so I think that some viewers forget about this conversation when they're thinking mm-hmm. about this particular storyline. Anthony basically here, he recognizes is that Lady Whistledown has saved the Bridgertons, especially in this instance, and she prevented a worse outcome from befalling them. Yeah, that's a good point. And it, it, it is embarrassing for the family, but they're not ruined the way that Marina and the Featheringtons are. Yeah, it's interesting to remember that Anthony in this moment is certainly grateful for Lady Whistledown. How that might change in the future is anyone's guess. We don't know what's going to happen in season three. But in this moment, he kind of recognises it's been swung in a slightly beneficial way towards them. Yeah, and I think some of us, some of us have thought that maybe Anthony will be a different role to the two previous series that he's had of like the villain, oh, not the villain, the antagonist slightly and the protagonist in series two. And we are curious about what that role will be in series three. And maybe, yeah. maybe that this kind of thing will make him more amenable. He could be an ally to Penelope because he's got to grow as a character he's got to learn from his own season and show that he's changed beans Beans. we were having some technical difficulties with beans but we're thrilled that she's joined Daphne walks in from Cliveden everyone's surprised to see her but they all kind of realise she's exactly what they need to help them navigate the scandal and so they all go back into their battle strategy mode and they say that once they put an end to the rumours they'll all be able to go about their daily lives as if nothing has happened as if nothing is awry easy peasy right Not for Colin, though. I feel so bad for him in this scene where his kind of agency has been taken away from him a little bit. And you could argue that Penn did that as well. But his family are just so focused on their reputation and how they're going to deal with the scandal and kind of pretend that it never even happened and that that's the easy answer. You know, once once we've passed it, it'll be fine. Um, But they're not really paying attention to the fact that he's still hurting and still reeling. And it kind of seems to be at the bottom of everyone's priority. Yeah, nobody asked him how he was doing this entire time, I noticed. The Mm -hmm. entire episode, the only person who asked how Colin was, was Penn. I mean, I guess that is the plight of the middle child. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking from direct experience, of course. Of course, speaking from direct experience. It's just, I felt bad for him because he obviously dealt with a great deal of emotions in those past few days and it's really depressing to see that their family is more interested in making sure that they don't fall out of the good graces of the dawn than yeah. how Colin is feeling in particular. <laughs> yeah, he like he had an entire future mapped out in his head. Yeah. And that's just all kind of crumbled beneath him. And they're mm-hmm. all in like damage control mode, not interested. 
Yeah, and so he's kind of listening to this and you can feel that his kind of anger and hurt is really building up and we get a very nice little stormy glare from him. And, you know, pissed off hurt Colin is a beautiful combination. We are taking notes. Yeah, he looks good. I mentioned the makeup earlier, but and there's still mm. that hint that the outfit is dark colours. There's always a point is made of the dark colours on the lead in Bridgerton. Mm-hmm. Point well made here. But Colin, as lovely and upset as he's looking, he finally kind of snaps and sarcastically tells the room that he's so very glad that all this has been settled on his behalf. And he storms out the room and he quite politely slams the door behind him bless his heart (laughs) although he's clearly upset about it i think it is noticeable that he doesn't actually really fight for marina he kind of he lets them settle it and he doesn't challenge them do you think that we're gonna get this as a contrast in season three when he has to actively fight for pen if he has to stand up to his family in a way that he just doesn't with marina i think it might be a little bit different because like i mentioned in our past episode violet i think knew that colin wasn't in love with her as he thought that he was there will be less pushback because like if anything the bridgertons are all about a love match antony since he's been married will probably soften a little bit as well I think there will be a little bit of pushback, but I don't think we'll, it will be as much because they'll all see that he's truly in love with her. I don't think that they take Colin serious because of his age. Perhaps he will have matured to a point where they talk less about how he's flighty and flirty and more they're like, oh, like you're legit about this, my lord. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be such a different reaction to the mm-hmm. engagement, I think. Also, the family unit has changed. Now we have like kind of mm-hmm. Kate in the mix. It just reminds me of that bit in An Offer from a Gentleman where Benedict looks at Colin and kind of sees him and realizes that he's grown up. Like we know they've included parts of Penn and Colin's book into the second season. There might be like a scene like that from Benedict's book or from whatever. Yeah, I love that. Colin has gone back to his bedroom where we find him quietly looking over some of his maps. This is our first indication that the way he's going to deal with this entire situation is to head off on his tour after all and run away from the disaster. But Daphne follows him because she's kind of twigged that he's not happy. And she asks if he really did want to marry Marina. And he says that he did. He still thinks he did at this point. And Daphne brings a little bit of her main plot drama into the conversation. And she kind of as her troubles with Simon bleed into her conversation with Colin. And she says that he should consider himself lucky not to have married a stranger, that Colin didn't know Marina. And he's fortunate that all of this came out before they got married. And then Colin tells his sister that she must think he's a fool, but my heart pays no heed to mere logic. When I think of her, I only want to be with her, despite all reason otherwise. He's saying these words, but it doesn't feel like he's meaning them. This is Luke's cat, like as Colin trying to sort of say these words in a way that almost to convince himself but Mm -hmm. he does like we don't believe him and we're not meant to fully believe him i don't think i totally agree i think it's luke newton acting as colin and colin thinking he's in love yeah he's trying to perform being in love but all that time whilst luke is trying to convey that genuinely and honestly so that the colin is being as genuine as he can be luke also knows that that isn't how colin would be actually in love so he's holding that side back so that when we get to season three we get the contrast some of the points he's making here it's almost like what he thinks is expected of him where like he says that he only wants to be near her he hasn't really made an effort to be near her even in season two there's more of an effort for him to see pen when their family was going through a crisis with the the gem the gems in georgia you know (laughs) that's true yeah yeah. There there was much more of an effort to help her and be around her. I think the other thing too, Colin is trying to save face as well. Especially within his family because they all doubted him in this situation like you you're acting too rashly. Right. And he was stood in front of Anthony being like this is true, this is real, and now it's all completely gone to shit. And so his worst fear of being viewed as a child and making silly decisions has completely hit him in the face. Daphne definitely empathises with him in this moment, but she, you know, she's firm, he can't see her. It's just this really lovely moment where Colin's so quietly frustrated and he just kind of turns away back to his maps. And then he kind of stands there and there's this beautiful shot of him where he says, Leander swam a by dust to every single night in complete darkness just to see his love. And if you're not familiar with this Greek myth involving Hera and Leander, fear not, because we have beans on hand to give us a rundown. Beans, what on earth is he talking about? Give me a quick second, because I read it and don't remember it. (laughs) That's the goal, because, I mean, I've got, I studied Greek mythology for five years at uni, and I don't think anything that would come out of my mouth will compete with what you're going to say. Okay, so the story is... A hero. No, that's the girl's name. Oh, goddamn. Her name is Hero. <laughs> <laughs> 
Give me that. <laughs> Keep this in. <laughs> yeah, that's her name. She's called Hero. Okay, well, <laughs> Hero was a virgin. <laughs> She was a, she was she was the hot girl, you know. Oh, a hot virgin. Okay, so Hero was a hot virgin <laughs> that Leander fell in love with, and they lived on opposite sides of what I'm assuming is the Greek world, called Hellas Point. <laughs> yeah, it still exists. It's like um, near Turkey, I think. Oh, Ooh, showing my dumb Americanness. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then oh oh oh, he swam across from one part of the Greek world to the other part of the Greek world to find her, as Colin says. And then she, Hero would make a lamp inside of a tower to be a guiding light. Woohoo. And then one night a storm came through and... Oh man, this is my type of story. My, a storm came through <laughs> and he couldn't find the light. So he swam for hours and died. <laughs> and you're just discovering it as you're telling everyone. Yeah, so he swam for hours, lost his way, and then and then he died. And then uh, Hero, our wonderful virgin princess, priestess, whatever, found his body. Well, that I wouldn't want to find my lover's body. That sucks. And then she just decided, I am also going to dive into the water. Yes. With that parallel, Colin didn't do any of that. No, thank goodness. <laughs> Would he have? Maybe. The myth is kind of more about how the idea of love can blur your judgment. It is interesting that this is a story he identifies with, because in a way that you can argue he actually is like Leander, but probably not in the way he wants to be. <laughs> Instead of being this romantic hero, he's led astray and he pays the consequences. And if you pay attention to him in season two... He's drowning! He is drowning. You know, he's drowning yeah. emotionally. He's kind of lost at sea and adrift, but also he is constantly drinking. It's not the way he wanted to be Leander, but it's certainly reminiscent of it. Oh my god, you guys are so smart. Um, (laughs) I think there are far more parallels between Pollen and another little cheeky Greek myth. The Odyssey. I definitely think there are some Odyssey parallels uh, that Colin is clearly missing. I mean, it's right in there with her name, for God's sake. I've posted about this on Reddit before, so I'll link you there. Obviously, we have the name Penelope, which you can't really use without kind of invoking the myth within itself. And then we have obviously the parallels between Odysseus's travels, just as Colin travels around, and the struggles as Odysseus tries to find his way back home. So the Odyssey is about the Greek concept of homecoming, and it takes Odysseus a very long time time to get back to his Penelope, just as you could argue it takes Colin a very long time to get to her, especially in the books. And there's a lot of Greek symbolism within his bedroom. He's clearly well-versed in Greek mythology and he goes to Greece and that's a big part of his story in the season. Featherington House has deliberate classical Greek features added to the front of it. They've actually added those features on that don't exist on the actual property where they film in Bath. So I feel like they're definitely layering the connections. But back to Colin and Daphne, it seems that Daphne was a little bit too revealing when she was speaking to him. And Colin has kind of twigged that something is wrong in a way that the others in the family haven't noticed. And he asks if something happened back at Cliveden. Ugh, (laughs) I just love him. And we've kind of discussed that he's very observant. Yeah, middle child syndrome, baby. (laughs) Yeah, more than people give him credit for. This scene actually is very similar in a way to chapter 19 of The Duke and I, just without the marina drama. And Daphne sidesteps Colin's questions, but she softens and she offers to chaperone a visit between Marina and Colin. And Colin jumps at the opportunity and he promises her and us that she's going to see that his passions are not in vain, eh? The next day, Colin is waiting by the window of the room in, I think it's Hastings House, I assume so, whilst Daphne is kind of looking over him really sadly. So this is the waistcoat that Colin wears to the Danbury Ball, the blue velvet suit, and he's wearing a dusky sort of pinkish purple cravat. I see the lighter colours as being more like childish, and I think that highlights his vulnerability in this scene. And later when he's speaking to Anthony, and I'll refer to it then, but he's sort of a bit darker and a bit more... Like, you know, he's with his older brother and he is taking more of an older, more mature approach to it. Whereas this scene, he's like fully laid bare. But yeah, Marina enters the room and they all kind of, they both turn to look at her. And Daphne thanks her for coming. But Marina says that, you know, she didn't think she had a choice. And it's kind of a sad reminder that this is Marina who pretty much has no options left. Daphne, I love Daphne in this scene where she's like, I really need to stay in this room and make sure, you know, I, I have to be a chaperone here. And she sits down with her book and she's like watching soaking up all the drama 
it breaks my heart this scene because he steps towards her and he and he kind of asks her to tell her that it isn't true and he's still trying not to assume the worst in her and still kind of clinging to the hope that it's all a misunderstanding or it's all a lie and there is an argument that there's that naivety of him in this situation but I also think there's just something inherently decent about the way he allows her to have her side of the story but I think you know Marina is, is done with the whole thing she's done deceiving him she simply tells him that it is and then he he asks if she's with child and she nods and she's I think Ruby Barker plays this scene gorgeous they both do I think they play it gorgeously she has these tears in her eyes and in turn Colin's so confused and he says I do not understand we were to be wed you you said you loved me there's some great acting from newts here you can kind of sense that Colin really wanted to believe in love and be in love like we saw how excited he was in in episode six when Marina said she loved him the first time so yeah he's just heartbroken yeah. here you know he almost kind of chokes the word back when Marina says that she holds him in the greatest esteem and then he says to her because he's so he's hurting so much he says to her you're a cruel woman indeed to stand here and talk of friendly affection as if you've not committed a grave sin against me she defends herself and she says that no one in her life kind of guided her Colin might see her as a villain but she isn't she's just doing what she had to I think this is the point where all of her emotions are breaking out as well she's trying to explain to Colin that he was the only man who offered her a glimpse of happiness and I think that's another dagger to his heart because he like loses composure a little bit and he's like you know, should I be lucky that, that you did this to me, that you chose me? Uh, which kind of echoes what Penn said earlier in the season about him. But at least he's starting to finally realise that it is a lie. And she, Marina doesn't really have anything to say back to him. And he tries to regain his composure. There's this sweet little moment where he just kind of tries to gather himself and be as like brave in the situation, as, a, as gentlemanly in the situation as he can be, because he's slightly lost his composure. And he says that it's going to take his leave of her for the last time. And I think we all know that he doesn't manage to do that physically, or emotionally, and that what happens in this room really stays with him for a long time. Yeah. As he's leaving here, he turns back and he says, you wish to know the cruelest part of your deception? If you had simply come to me and told me of your situation, I would have married you without a second thought. To reinforce the idea that Pollen are meant to be, I wonder if Penn, unlike Marina, will be honest with Colin about Lady Whistledown in season three. Like, as much as I like how he finds out in the book, I think Penn might need to disclose her secret to Colin in season three in order for them to get their happy ending based on the way this particular scene plays out. Um, that said, I also kind of like the idea of Colin, who we know from season two is very clever and is already starting to piece together clues about potential Lady Whistledown suspects, namely Eloise, discovering mm -hmm. the truth before she confesses and just not saying anything about it. Maybe just like basically waiting for her to share her truth with him. Yeah. My personal theory is that he's still going to find out in the church. I think he's going to have a suspicion, but he's going to figure out that she's Lady Whistledown in the church. Spoilers from the book. But I think that Devlin's going to have a role in part of that you're really on board the Devlin train aren't you guys I think I mentioned this but I think Colin is going to be more upset that Devlin mm -hmm. knew before <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point because you know I think what bothers him most in this situation isn't what Marina did in terms of you know I don't think he's upset that she was pregnant or in love with someone else he was mostly upset that she lied to him yeah also, on the other hand, with Penn, if it is really love, maybe he won't care <laughs> that she was deceiving him. Do you think that he would have still married Marina had he known the truth beforehand? Probably yes, in that in the moment. Mm, so I think he would have because I think he was still in the young mindset here. And yeah, he would he have regretted it afterwards? Definitely. Yeah, he would. But I think yeah, he would have done that. Hero Colin knows no bounds, especially in series one. Yeah, but like I mentioned previously, he still does really care about appearances he says he would however as we know his actions have spoken otherwise this entire episode so who's to say it would actually happen on some level he does know that he he was never in love with marina yeah. you know he never said it back to her when she said it to him but i think this particular colin is so lost in everything that's happened that he can't quite distinguish that just yet God, well, that was a bit heavy, so let's go lighten the mood by hanging out at the Queen's Lunch and have a nice little get-together, shall we? The Bridgertons all rock up together. According to Violet, it's lovely that they're all there together. Look at that, a whole alphabet together. It turns out that her Colin is also a sassy Colin, which is good to note, as we get another of our fan favourite lines for him, like we do as the honours. Lovely indeed, we should tempt scandal more often. It's a great line. The delivery is... And we'll have more of that for season three. Thank you. I do feel bad that he's been forced back into society when he clearly wants to run away and hide. But he's got a show face to save face. And who else is going to show up but the Featheringtons, Sans Marina. Portia is looking pretty sheepish for once in her life. And the rest of the ton and the Queen visibly react to them daring to show their faces. 
Yeah, I love the costume choice here as well. They're very gaudy clothes. Mm -hmm. Portia's wearing an old dress, which we will see again in 301. Beans? Reduce. Reuse. Recycle. Baby. (laughs) Reduce. Reuse. Recycle. Baby. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. The gaudiness, it highlights their elf places. Uh, We do get a quick comment from a judgy mama. Is that her character name? Potentially. That's actually her character name. Yeah. Okay. Who comments that they try to entrap poor Mr. Bridgerton, which is an important reminder that Penn preserved Colin's reputation at the cost of her own families. Penn has tried to be sympathetic to protect Colin and take the blame completely away from him. But And, you know, and we can see that the Ton are listening and that they are siding with the version of events that Penn's put forward. But speaking of Penelope, Eloise kind of runs up, pulls her bestie away. You know, they're fully made up together now. And Elle's really concerned about how Penn's doing and she asks after her family and they're not doing great. And Portia swears that they're ruined. But the first thing that Penelope asks, she's not interested in herself. Like, what's she interested in? But what of Colin? Is he in pieces from the news? Even though her own reputation is ruined, her first thought is of Colin, as but always. But what of Colin? But what of Colin? Colin? But she kind of needs to know that it worked and yeah. that he's doing okay. And she's aware that what she did has a short-term negative impact on him and that her actions have hurt him. Yeah. But she's ho- hoping that there's a long-term benefit in saving him for his own good. Did anybody notice that her eyes were like piercingly blue in that scene? She was like glowing. She was like, oh, Colin's free now. <laughs> in typical Elle fashion, she's dismissive of Colin. And she, you know, she assumes that he's just got wounded pride, completely missing the fact that he's in absolute pieces. Yeah. Lady Down has gone too far this time, Elle decides, and she's taking it personally that the writer is after the reputation of best friend. Don't worry though, she's got a plan. They're going to track her down and force her to print a retraction. God love Elle with all of her... Uh, solutions it all goes to ship the featheringtons i you know portia's trying to suck up to violet by throwing marina under the bus but violet is not having it violet's probably also thrilled to know that they're not going to be directly related to the featheringtons anymore (laughs) there's a vagueness of are we meant to feel a bit bad for portia but then i'm like she did actually do all the things that violet is assuming she did yeah (laughs) Mm -hmm. i think i i I think we're supposed to see how bad it is for them and that You know, because they're always getting ruined. They're always getting ruined left, right and centre. But we need to see that this is really pretty disastrous what Penn has decided to do to the family. And also, we've talked about this before, but all these characters are really nuanced and layered, complex Mm -hmm. characters. So even if they do bad things, you kind of understand why they did it. You know their motivations and you kind of sympathise with them a little bit, even if you don't agree with their previous actions. I also think it very clearly demonstrated the power of Lady Whistledown, which we have seen before, but this, we are specifically seeing it affect a family of the Tawn in front of us. Because we didn't see Bearbrook leave, you know, we didn't see things like that. Um, and we didn't care about him either. We right. we, we didn't like him. We saw right. him as like a pantomime villain. Mm-hmm. But Brimsley appears and tells the Featheringtons to leave. Everyone watches on as Penn follows her family and get humiliatingly kicked out of the luncheon. So Mm -hmm. later in this episode, the Queen is insulted when Lady Whistledown doesn't write about this luncheon. But while Lady Whistledown writes that no event merited a mention in her her society papers, what actually happens is that Penn was unable to write about the event because she was kicked out here. She wasn't able to hear Mm -hmm. any gossip. Yeah, and it's not like she was going to write necessarily about her family being kicked out because, you know, that would just be adding more fuel to the fire of, like, the pain that they're in. That's true. And you know my theories by now about Lady Whistledown and the Bridgertons in season three, but I just want to say I think it's very interesting that the Queen mentions that it's far worse for nothing to be written about you than it is for something odious to be written about you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the absence of commentary can be far more damaging than a bad portrayal. All news is good news. I also think that's why she amped up her search for Lady Whistledown because she was more upset that she wasn't being talked about than she was, which kind of goes to show that the Queen maybe lets on that she's annoyed by Lady Whistledown, but in fact, she quite enjoys the the gossip. We've also talked about this in terms, I think, of Eloise before, but next season, it's possible that the Bridgertons might be in some trouble and that Lady Whistledown not writing about it puts them in harm's way yeah Mm -hmm, definitely but we can leave the luncheon because pen's been kicked out so we don't need to stay around we're not going to follow marina and daphne all the way but we're just going to jump in on them here because we get the beginning of the subplot where daphne gets involved with marina daphne says marina has nothing to apologize for which i think we can all disagree with daphne um i think that's definitely a moment where daphne is projecting 
onto Marina, as I think she does with this whole subplot, yeah, yeah, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. She is very much trying to... Ju- <laughs> Daphne, babe, we see through you. She's very much trying to justify her own actions. And I think they're very different situations. It's a narrative tool, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. It's definitely more about Daphne making a, making herself feel better than Daphne actually forgiving Marina for what she did to Colin. Um, the first thing Marina does is apologise and say, for what it's worth, I'm sorry, your brother is a sweet boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, boy. And it, this kind of proves that she didn't properly view him as a real suitor and just saw him as a child or as a something to as a play thing almost yeah exactly. an easy solution yeah yeah and this is revisited in series two when he goes to visit her and she essentially says what amounts to grow up <laughs> but i think i like daphne in this scene and she's implying that George is at fault. He needs to take accountability for what he's done as a member of the Men Are Trash Brigade. Mm. I'm with Daphne here. <laughs> um, obviously, I don't support all of Daphne's actions, but yeah, to speak of the truth here, if George were alive, which, spoiler, we know he isn't, then... I'm not a man apologist, but Daphne, pff, my girl. <laughs> yeah, she. Pick your moments, my love. Complex character. But it always bugs me that Daphne's the one who gets the apology and not Colin. And even Penelope gets a form of apology later. Yeah. And, you know, Marina, we'll touch on this next season because it's probably more pertinent then, but Marina never apologises to Colin. And I think that leaves him very messed up about his level of accountability in the situation. And, you know, just to very quickly sum up the rest of this subplot before we leave it, but this episode dips in and out of this kind of dynamic, the back and forth with Daphne and Marina as Daphne's trying to help her. Daphne ends up trying to track down Sir George and get him to return to take full responsibility for Marina and their child. And at first, Marina is grateful, but she ends up becoming really frustrated with Daphne's methods of tracking him down. I do sympathise with Marina in some ways, but this is definitely not her finest episode. Um, She's obviously getting a bit desperate, but she's particularly ungrateful to Daphne, who in this situation is just trying to help really and Mm. you know just because she didn't get Simon to if she'd got Simon to sign his name would she have found something else wrong with it like this ends up working as well though yeah exactly yeah Yeah. we have that part of Marina's character where she she kind of thinks she always assumes she knows more about the world and everyone else it's like you know I'm not sure that's always true it is like if there was someone at school who like was the first person to get a steady boyfriend and stuff yeah they would always talk like they knew absolutely everything and like if they just because you're sexually active doesn't mean you know everything and I feel like it's similar here a lot she used over Penelope she used her life experience over Penelope but it's a bit like can you use that against a duchess who's married I don't know but Marina ends up deciding that Daphne's plan isn't going to work and she declares that it's over for her and rightly or wrongly Marina has given up on anyone else finding a way out for her we're going to go hang out with Penn and Elle over in Eloise's bedroom Eloise is back to her Lady Whistled on sleuthing having realised that the article Marina was different this one was personal She's so close, but so far. Also, a quick note, if you look in Eloise's bedroom, she has a telescope. Have you noticed this? And it was purposely moved to be looking across the road, exactly where Featherington House is, as a little hint that Eloise is on her journey searching for her, and the answer is right there across the road. Will Colin be using that telescope in series three? Oh, I'm sure. He's now a stalker, guys. (laughs) Just... (laughs) Just a little bit of voyeurism. That's canon. That's canon, though. <laughs> Peeping Colin was not on my bingo card for season three. He's always like, I really just need to go to this um, musical just because, you know, I just need to be there. Oh, I really need to follow her and track her down. <laughs> he is a bit of a stalker, but we love him for it. Elle is quizzing Penn on who knew about the pregnancy, to which Penelope says that every servant in the household knew. You know, I see what you're doing, Penn. Make the possibilities as wide as, as she can. Do you notice in this scene, she acts so, so young. Her costume's young as well. Yeah, she's in like a very tantalising, like the bus line's really high. It's like really childish pink, isn't it? And this isn't how she normally is, especially around Eloise. But you notice it in her voice, her actions, like her gestures, are very yes. childish and her demeanour. Do you think that she's doing this deliberately because Eloise is very, very close to the true answer and she's kind of desperately trying to deflect as much as possible by being too young and too naive to be the culprit. Yes. Eloise is right that there's only a few people who this could have been, so it's getting very, very close to her being found out and I think she's just trying anything to deflect. Yeah, Penn is being very, like, underhanded here. She very cleverly Mm -hmm. manipulates um, Elle later in this conversation into agreeing to go to the concert that's taking place that night, knowing that Elle has no real interest in society events or really even entering society and it's probably 
probably just so she can pump her for information and gossip since she's unable to attend herself as well. As a side note, Penn's decision to send Elle to this concert eventually ends up saving Penn because by attending the concert, Elle learns that Lady Whistledown is now being hunted by the Bow Street Runners on the Queen's orders, and Elle later stops them from catching Lady Whistledown, so this ended up working out pretty well for her. Yeah, it's that careful manipulation that I'm sure Eloise, in time to come, reflects back on and kind of sees how she has been used in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Another little detail in this scene that I really like and could be potential foreshadowing for season three um, and has not yet been revisited on the show, here Penn says that she will take the back stairs so that no one will see her leaving the Bridgerton house. If the writers are going to tell us that Penn knows how to sneak in and out of the Bridgerton house without being seen, can we please see this happen in season three? I want you to stay. (laughs) This is what we need. We want... So basically, our shopping list is Colin crying, but looking very beautiful while she does it. Colin climbing up the side of the Featherington house Uh and getting into her bedroom window, whilst Penn is preferably in a very lovely nightgown. And Penn sneaking into his house for a little midnight rendezvous. And then Irish maid Penn being caught by Colin. And Irish maid Penn. (laughs) Shonda (laughs) callers. We've We've got a list. Yeah. (laughs) And it's too late now, but we can still dream. (laughs) So, Yelek, you mentioned the concert that is tonight. Everyone else is going, but you know he's not feeling like going tonight. Poor Colin. He's had a rough time of it. He's not feeling up to it. He's going to spend some time with his maps, as again, he's planning on running away from his issues. Anthony pours him a drink, and he says that he wants to apologise, which feels like a bit of a big moment from uh, Anthony there. And Colin is himself taken aback and it it breaks through his really low mood and he makes a little quip about it being the end of days because Anthony is finally, you know, ready to apologise for something. At least he gets some form of apology from someone. And it's it's just a lovely scene. Anthony kind of scoffs affectionately and he concedes that he has been too harsh with Colin in this episode and probably the last episode when they had their confrontation. And, you know, Colin's still very embarrassed. We talked about it earlier that he's probably more embarrassed about how his family now view him even... (gasps) Uh, I need to tap out. I just spilled something. <laughs> okay. Are you permanently tapping out or you'll be back? Shall be back. I'll just continue. Shall be back. <laughs> anyway, Colin concedes that Anthony was trying to protect him for his more foolish impulses. You know, he really does keep using this word fool to refer to himself. And, you know, last episode we talked about the uneven dynamic that they have between them, especially when they're arguing, you know, that sort of dynamic of a father reprimanding a son rather than two brothers together. But I think this scene kind of completes that circle and heals that dynamic a little bit because they sit down together as equals. Anthony approaches the entire scene more of an older brother and a peer. So he's still giving that advice and that guidance, but more of a an older brother figure than a father telling him off kind of way. And I think that's exactly what Colin needed in this episode that he hasn't really got from anywhere else. You know, a gentle reprimand, an apology, and just a reassurance that he is going to be okay. Uh, First of all, what you said about him referring to himself as a fool, that's so true because he ends up repeating the same phrase in uh, episode eight. This scene with Antony is kind of interesting because Antony is obviously drawing from his own troubles with Sienna to reassure Colin that although he's hurting, the pain will pass. It just reminds me of what Beans was saying, I think, earlier about Daphne using her own experiences with Colin and then with Marina. And I think I really like that they're doing that in the episode where other characters' storylines are interacting. So, you know, if Benedict is going through something in season three, how is he going to use that experience to kind of yeah. inform the way he approaches? It's these like layers of connectivity between the storylines I really enjoy. Yeah. And, you know, the scene gets a bit heavier as they both reflect on the hurt they feel. But I think what helps Colin is that Anthony gives him the approval that he needed and that he's so is was looking for Mm -hmm. and Anthony says you have the love of all your family and the honor of your actions soon you'll forget Miss Thompson's name and it will be as if you never loved her at all we also get another moody shot of Colin here so shout out to the hair makeup and lighting team who all worked on this particular scene to convey like the mood and the emotions he's got a great Mm -hmm. outfit here again a moody palette for a somber Colin that Mm momochola you can contrast this to look at the the boy he was earlier when he was having that conversation with Marina and the lighter clothing um and now he has kind of like this darker waistcoat it's just everything works together to set this scene yeah it's a bit heavy and i think colin feels it too that they've both taken a little dip and he tries to lighten the mood by joking with his brother about anthony's dismal troubling words of comfort and i think they're both struggling but it's nice to see that they're leaning on each other as equals and having a laugh together and i think 
we, we start to see a little bit of Colin emerge back out of the drowning pain and you know a little bit of humour. It's still very delicate and tentative though. Based on what we see in this scene, I wonder if Anthony is going to be, as we speculated before, Anthony is going to be the sibling who helps guide Colin through his darkest moments in the second half of season three. Again, following the role that Daphne played for Anthony in season two. This is episode seven. And if you compare this to episode seven of season two, they have the same structure in episode seven of this, where they're dealing with the scandal. So who knows what the scandal is going to be in uh, season three, episode seven. Mm-hmm. Beans, you just want it to involve Devlin, don't you? I think you're like Devlin's biggest fan. No, 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 no. Uh, my thought was the biggest scandal is just going to be them fucking in the carriage. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I was like, oh, by episode seven, they're going to rock it. Poor Veg is uh, having a nightmare. (laughs) I was plugging in my laptop because my laptop needed a charge. And then I, as I was plugging my laptop, I knocked over a glass of water onto the floor. Yeah. And I knocked over a wine glass and the wine glass (laughs) glass is on the floor now. (laughs) (laughs) I have a lot of cleanup to do. We're very nearly at the end of the episode now, but I think we have a difficult scene to end on. Penelope is outside Marina's door, wanting to talk with her cousin, and she kind of knocks, but there's no response. Just a quick question. What do you think she was planning on saying to Marina? Would Surely, do you think she was going to reveal that she was the one who exposed her, or...? No, I think she was just... I mean, that feels like a step too far. I think she was just going in to comfort her because she was feeling guilt. But, like, it's very obvious that Pen really appreciated Marina's presence being there because she felt so lonely. And they did have a genuine bond before it all completely went to hell. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Despite knowing that she did the right thing to protect Colin, she does feel Mm -hmm. guilt. And I think that's why she goes to speak to her. She took no pleasure in it, as we saw at the end of the last episode. And the consequences for Marina have been incredibly severe. And there's no way to get about that, especially when we, we see what happens in the scene next. But it isn't about Penn enjoying it. It's Penn thinking that, you know, it doesn't matter what the fallout was. It's just this is how deep a price she was willing to pay to save the person that she loved. Penelope opens the door to find Marina collapsed on the floor, um, having taken the tea that we've earlier saw her prepare. This was in an attempt to end her pregnancy. And Pen runs to her cousin's side, tries to comfort her, even though she's unconscious, and she screams for help from Portia, who kind of runs in and is just completely horrified by what's happened. Yeah, and I was thinking, why didn't she earlier try the tea? And I think it made me think that I think she did genuinely want this baby like Mm -hmm. um she wanted a good father for her child and i think maybe part of her was still holding on to sir george coming back but when you first think about it it's surprising that she didn't take it sort of as soon as she found out she was pregnant but i think she that does show that she really had she really did love george and she had this hope of a family with him i think this scene too was a huge realization for penelope she realized just how much her words can affect a person. Being faced with that was probably an incredibly terrifying for her to realize and realize the weight of her words. Because before then, you know, outside of the Bear Book situation, a lot of the things she wrote were just sort of like, you know, little quibs and she would be strict with her words, but this was a... Recoverable. Yeah. I think Marina spent the season struggling to find her agency in the situation. This is maybe her last attempt at trying to take control of her own life, but she's also at a point where there are no other options for her. And like you say, Beans, I don't think there was one second where Penn thought that this was what she thought Marina was going to do, but... Yeah. And and it's a good point what you were saying, actually, because it made me think that Penn might be able to control the narrative in a way and might be able to spin things a certain way. And she knows she has power, but can she always control the personal fallout from her actions? Right, no. You know, she might be able to control society's approach or opinions, but can she control how an individual chooses to react by what she does? No, she has no control over that. Personally, like, I'm... I don't want this to sound rude, but I think that would be Lady Whistledown's downfall. Yeah. Is not yeah. considering that others will have a reaction that may not be the reaction she intends. Yes. Mm. Like like Eloise, you know, she intended that in a certain way. And Eloise was within her right to, to not really care about the intentions behind right. it. And so, yeah, was it morally right for Penn to do? No. But, you know, as we said repeatedly in this episode, she wasn't acting out of concern for moral implications. Mm. And she chose to sacrifice her own reputation, her family's reputation, Marina's reputation, Mm -hmm. to protect someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I like what you say, you know, she's going to have to grow. 
Yeah. In terms of reconciling her power with what she wants to achieve and how she achieves it. Yeah. I think there's a lot of space for that in season three. Gossip can be fun and it's a tool that we use within society to decide what, like, who is and isn't, like, a safe person. It helps change people's opinions about certain things within our society. However, this was very much a, like, let me give you a a beans life. (laughs) (laughs) An anecdote. (laughs) An anecdote. When I was younger and I was upset with someone, I would post about how I was upset with them on social media. And it never worked in my favor. This is the equivalent of fucking Penelope Mm -hmm. posting on Facebook about how she's pissed about something. It it never, ever works. We know her actions. We know she was drawn into a corner. I understand why she did that. I think for the future of Penn and for the future of Lady Whistledown, she needs to learn how to communicate, especially with those within her life. Yeah, she's got some growing to do, for sure. Yeah. And she needs to learn to reconcile the two parts of her, I think. Yes. I think Nick said in an interview that, you know, she she kind of has the ability to separate. And I wonder if she does this here too, to be honest, mm-hmm. because she's so young in this particular thing. She has the ability to separate Lady Whistledown from her own identity. And does that mean that she separates the Whistledown fallout yeah. to her own actions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, you know, since there is this particular scene in the show, if you are someone who's struggling with emotions that you feel are overwhelming, please uh, seek help and yeah. reach out to somebody. You are never alone. And it's important for you to realize that there are people out there who are looking to help you and make sure that you're okay. So we want you here. Yeah. I think we touched on it in this episode as well, is that a lot of this is about the Regency world of how like women maybe didn't have autonomy yeah. or women had to take the fall for situations. And, you know, we're 200 years on and I think there's still a huge amount of resonance with today. Oh, yeah. You know, have we moved on that far? No. Yeah. So it's a pretty heavy end to the episode mm-hmm. and, you know, Marina will be OK, but we don't know that yet. So it's a very, very fraught way to end the episode. So I think we need a little detox. Lucky, can you take us through the whistle ups and the whistle downs? My runner up for the whistle up for this week goes to the, just because I find this scene funny, I'm so sorry, but the bird that narrowly avoids being shot by Moody Simon in the opening <laughs> sequence. And I, I, it's so stressful <laughs> when they're having their little like piano off. Her piano off, yeah. I hope his brethren were just as lucky <laughs> and he wasn't the only <laughs> bird that escaped being shot that day. But um, our actual whistle up for this episode is the scene where Penelope hints that she knows how to get in and out of the Bridgerton house without being seen. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed this is revisited in season three. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. And so our whistle down for this week, although I think we'll come to see that Colin views Penelope very differently and that their relationship is leagues above what he shared with Marina, the way that Colin speaks of Marina during their farewell and how heartbroken he seems and how hurt he is by her betrayal is just kind of a bummer for Pollen fans. Yeah. And the heartbroken Colin will be very satisfying when it's about Penn. It's just a little bit heart wrenching mm-hmm. when it's not. <laughs> mm-hmm. That, that's the end. Anyone got any last little gems they want to throw out? Any little tidbits? Facts, oh man, guess what? Next week is my hard eyes moment, so get ready for me to talk endlessly. And by that I mean <laughs> a minute and 30 seconds about my hard eyes moment. <laughs> what is it? Catch and toast? Or what? The, the final scene? Yeah, when he when he walks into the ball and he's like, <laughs> yes, I, yes, yeah, that's like I tell you, it's like he's it's he's pen is the north on his compass. He just kind of turns to her and like they have this great. Uh-huh. Sorry, we'll get into that next episode. Get ready for me to literally shit my pants. <laughs> is that your big moment? That's my big moment. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, you've got that support. You know what? I think we've done it. The past few episodes have been heavy. Season one is really heavy from a pollen perspective, don't you think? <laughs> They're all heavy. <laughs> Season two is heavy too. <laughs> I know, but their dynamic is just different. I think their friendship is different. I think this is so relentlessly bleak. Yeah. But we threw it. And I think episode eight is a bit more cathartic. Yeah. So we'll have some lightness. We'll have some catch and toast going around. I'll let the catch, I'll let the catch, I'll let the catch and toast go around. So you've got that to look forward to. But in the meantime, where can everyone find us, Lucky? You can find us at WhatabarbPod on Instagram and TikTok. And you can find us on reddit.com forward slash r forward slash Paul in Bridgerton. And I've been asked to remind people of our usernames. So we have obviously Oblivious90, who's Ovs, me, Veggies Bay, Lakimerick, which is Lecky or Lechi, and Cool Beans Friend which has been thank you very much we love you all over on this sub and we'll see you very soon and until then only one thing left for it beans see us out
Does violin do 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 do? Do 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 do